Hey, look at this. Everybody's back. Everybody has gone on Friday, feels like. How's tennis one? Yeah. Looked like you guys were headed that way. Good deal. All right. So now we get into get. There it is. It said 216, so I started going because I thought I heard it. Um so today we're gonna we're gonna get into some more calculations, um, but we're we're gonna start using moles and start using atomic mass and start doing some of the math behind um, the weighted averages um, on the periodic table. And then we're gonna get into ionic and covalent compounds, which if you remember the term from back when we talked about um, pure substances versus mixtures, we said compounds is when you've got two or more elements combined together, right? Um, so we're going to start talking about how that all works first. Um, just as a as a recap, as a way to check your answers on the lab from last week. Um, if you, I know I've pointed out ptable.com before, but if you go to ptable and then you go up to the top, instead of it defaults to opening up in properties, but if you open up in electrons, one it color codes everything by orbital block, which is kind of nice. The other thing that's nice about this is if you if you hover over any of the different elements, it actually, not only does it tell you their um, electron configuration when they're in their ground state, it'll also give you their um, electronic orbital diagram um, with the with the y-axis. So like we've been practicing doing, you can check your answers for last week's lab. Um, by checking here and where it's on your lab, where it says the, what was the exact wording, Nusa? Um, abbreviated orbital diagrams. Abbreviated orbital diagrams means drawing it out just like this, just like your electron configuration, except without the y-axis being um, energy. So you would just write it out. Instead of writing 1s2, you draw either a line or a box. I don't care which one. It says 1s. It has two electrons in it. So, like this. All right. So, if it says abbreviated orbital diagram, this is what it's asking for. And again, boxes or lines. If it says electron configuration or shorthand, that's when it's saying. Right, just like this. You don't need the arrows. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Um, pretty quickly, we're going to not be using these very much because this is so much faster and has all the same information if we know how to fill up the boxes with our rules, right? So we don't need to write it out like this every time um, now that we're kind of all on the same page that way. All right. Um, lots of good, lots of good questions on the quiz, and a lot of them were relevant to the material. So I'm going to try and go through as many of them as I can. If I don't get to your question today, um, then odds are either I either responded to it already on Canvas, um, or we'll talk about it on uh, Wednesday or Friday. So somebody asked why filling in the d orbital is more stable than filling in the s orbital. Um, we know that big, bigger orbitals means more stability when you get it all the way filled up. Um, but why is that the case? I, th I thought this was a really, really good question because it is kind of hard to put your finger on why that would be other than just, well, because the teacher said so. Um, the best explanation I could come up with quickly, since I was trying to grade these quickly this morning, um, was that the closer you get to having a full orbital without actually getting all the way there is more unstable. So if you can get to, to um, you know, five sixths of a P orbital filled, that's really unstable. It really wants to get that one last electron um, to finish filling up the orbital. And and it, it kind of shows up mostly as like a percentage or as a fraction. 
And an S orbital can only be either empty, full, or half full, right? Because it can only hold a total of two electrons. But a P orbital can get really close to full, can get five sixths of the way full, right? If you have five out of the six possible slots filled. A D orbital can get nine tenths of the way full. Right, so as you, you can see how, as we get to the bigger orbitals, you can get closer and closer to full without actually making it there. And the closer you can get to full without actually making there, that's more unstable. So it's less that you get more of a stability bonus from a D orbital, and, and it's more that leaving it with nine tenths of the way filled is less stable. So it's, it's more about the, um, about the opposite case rather than we get a lot more stable when we get that. And that's, this is sort of mathematically, there's, there's more to it. That's sort of the, the best way I have of explaining it right now. Um, if you ask that question again you know, next year, then, then we can get into a little bit more detail about it. Um, but just a, that's, that's a reminder as to why a lot of the irregularities show up in that D block, right? And in, in the F block, not only do we have um, the ability to fill a D block before we fill the S block sometimes when we get close. Um, we also have those halfway filled orbitals start changing things and all of our energy levels start getting closer and closer together as we get closer to, as we get higher N values. Um, without looking into the, the, actually where is, let me do that real quick. We put up the um, to scale orbital diagram. Yeah. So this should look pretty familiar by now, right? This isn't perfectly to scale, but it still is good enough to show that as you get to higher and higher energy levels, all of the additional options and all the energy levels themselves start getting closer and closer together in energy. And the closer and closer we get in energy, the more tiny little corrections wind up throwing things off and the more irregularities you, can, you should be able to see. And so you wind up with, um, with the D orbitals and the F orbitals in particular, really throwing things off that way. Let's see if I can find one to scale real quick. Yeah. This is probably the best we can get. Notice. See how down here, one S and the two S have a big gap between them. And then the, as you get further and further up, they start getting closer and closer together. That's gonna cause a lot of those irregularities and why you start seeing weird stuff like, um, you know, filling the D block before the S block, what happens. All right, and so that kind of answers the second question here. So, why does the D block have such irregularities in the valence electrons? It's because those energy levels start getting so close together and we have to start taking into account the half filled versus the whole all the way filled versus the S block being filled. All of those things are sort of competing. Um, when asked how many valence electrons noble gases have, should we put zero or eight? You should never put zero for valence electrons unless unless it has zero electrons in the entire atom, right? Because there's always a highest occupied energy level. As long as you have at least one electron, there's a highest occupied energy level, which means there's a valence shell and you can count valence electrons, All right? So if you take away all of the electrons that are in the energy level that was that formerly the highest occupied energy level, now your highest occupied energy level is just one lower. So for calcium, calcium's electrons, when it's neutral, are in the 4s orbital, right? It has two valence electrons in the fourth energy level. 
you take those away, now its highest occupied energy level is three. And so you go back and look at how many electrons does it have in N equals three to count valence electrons. Um, how the heck do we figure out what the shape of an orbital is? Well, the same way that I can say it's shaped like a sine wave and everybody knows what a sine wave looks like. Does anybody ever, I guess that's, you could use your imagination and say you've seen a sine wave before, but it wasn't a perfect sine wave in the real world, right? How do you know what a sine wave looks like? Well, that's what the function looks like. When you plot X versus Y, you get a shape. That's how what we do for the orbitals as well. Turns out we can measure them experimentally a little bit. Um, there are some ways we can show like the shape of a d orbital, and they do map pretty well to um, to what we predict they should look like. But basically, we know what the function is. We know what the, the solutions to the Schrodinger's equation are um, that correspond to these set of quantum numbers. If we know what that looks like, we can graph it in 3D. So we don't measure it directly, but we can we can predict, and then the observations we can make match with our predictions. They haven't failed really at this point. So we don't have to add any adjustments to that. Um, what do we do if we have elements with four valence electrons when it comes to predicting the most stable charge? Anybody have any guesses? Round, round down, why? Or up? If you're gonna round, there's two choices, right? 50-50 shot. Um, well, it depends a little bit on what the energy level is. Um, because if you look at what column, what column has four valence electrons? What's the element at the top of it since the columns aren't labeled? It's carbon's column, right? Mm -hmm. So for carbon and silicon, they're non-metals, which means typically they get more stable by accepting electrons, but then germanium, tin, and lead are metals, which means they get more stable by giving away electrons. Okay. So how do we know what charge those are going to be when they're more stable. Um, what well, partly depends on what you're putting with them, and partly it, it depends on whether you're talking lead or carbon. And electron configuration can, act, can actually help us with that, which is part of why um, the next question this is a, a better way or a more sophisticated way of phrasing why do we have to bother learning this in the first place? Why does it matter? What's the importance of writing chemicals in, in electron configuration? Um, part of it is that it, it allows us to predict what stable ions we can see. So for instance, if I pull up lead here, can, it, can you guys read that, that section in the middle? Or is that, I didn't zoom in. No, that didn't help at all, did it? Um, Right here, but if I use the um, the shorthand notation where we just are going to look at the the last energy level, so everything's the same up to xenon, and then you get what six s two four f fourteen five d ten. So this is for lead. And then 6p2, right? If we want to know what charges might be stable for lead, we look at its electron configuration because that can tell us, okay, what are the what's going to be the easiest ways to, to make this more stable? To get to only having all the orbitals that are all the way filled or all the way empty or sometimes halfway filled exactly. So in this case, Lead's a pretty good example because it's got four valence electrons, but it has a, um, electrons in the 6p orbital that could just lose those two. It's not that stable having a partially filled orbital that's not halfway filled. So if you lose those two, now we're back to something where we only have energy level or only have orbitals that are all the way filled, right? So lead is relatively stable as a plus two. Turns out it's even more stable if you also get rid of 
the 6S2 because now it has, not only does it only have full um, orbitals, it only has full energy levels. Well, mostly filled because we didn't get to the 5F, but um, so that tells us lead can be stable as either a plus two or a plus four. So how do we predict things with four valence electrons? How do we predict what's gonna be most stable? Part of it is you look at what your electron configuration looks like. And part of it is going to depend on what energy levels we're looking at. Carbon in particular is not very good at losing electrons, at least not completely. We're going to talk about covalent compounds, if not today, then on Friday. Um, but there's a difference even within the same group, the same column on the periodic table, when it comes to what's going to be more stable. And that, like I said, that partially answers the... Why, do, why are we bothering with this? The other reason is because having, being able to know or being able to write electron configurations allows us to have the vocabulary that we need to be able to talk about electrons moving from one orbital to another orbital. We can do it just generally like that, but we wanted to get more specific. We say, okay, the energy difference between the 2S and the 2P is this. Therefore, it should absorb light in this wavelength. So if we don't know our, our electron configurations, then it's really hard to describe that in a way that everybody's going to be able to follow what I'm saying, right? So part of it is just learning the vocabulary so that we can discuss things. Any other stuff that was relevant to last week specifically that you want to ask out? Anything we've talked about so far? Any clarifications? Then we have time to look at some of the random, quote unquote, random questions that are kind of related, um, but are a little bit more fun. Somebody asked about color theory, not in as many words, but do lighter versions of a color have the same wavelength as, the, as that color? Um, or is that a different wavelength? So this actually gets in, there's a whole field of study called color science or color theory. Um, and the, the trickiest thing about color theory is it depends a lot on what your context is. Are you talking about as an artist trying to mix paints together? It's going to use a subtractive theory where they're talking about absorbing all the wavelengths of light that they don't want. Um, but an additive theory, which is the way we usually think about it in the sciences, is, okay, you have photons of a specific wavelength. How many do you have and what does that look like? Um, and so this is, this is one are two, two different ways of representing different colors in different lightness and saturation um, or value and saturation because Q, if you visualize these as cylinders, Q is what slice it is, what angle it is around that cylinder. That's gonna be, that's gonna define your wavelength, the dominant wavelength for that entire color. But then if you have other, colors mixed into it, other wavelengths of light mixed into it, then it can start to appear lighter in color. It can start to appear more like white light. Then if you just have, if you're just missing, if you have very, very few photons of that wavelength, then it might start looking like it's a dark orange versus a bright orange. Bright orange, saturated orange, we would expect to be very, a lot of photons of that wavelength. Nusa? So like on a computer, when you like, when it like, turns the colors into numbers. Mm -hmm. Does that come from wavelength or is that just like a computer thing? Mostly a computer thing. So like, like I said, it depends on your frame of reference and computers are sort of the art model of mixing colors together, but also they are producing photons. The screen is producing photons that go to your eye that you perceive as color. Um, and so it's, this is a computer scientist representation of how we could get these colors to show up. Um, and basically white represents when you have uh, equal number of photons across the entire spectrum. Black represents no photons at all. And the dominant hue is basically gonna be what is the most common photon. You have the most photons of this particular wavelength. Um, so yeah, you absolutely are gonna have other variations here. Um, of ways to understand this. The other tricky part with this is that um, if you bring, just because 
computer science, art theory, and physics isn't enough, we can bring the biochemistry into this, the biology of how we perceive color. Turns out that humans don't perceive all colors equally well. Um, are the proteins that, that respond to green and blue are more sensitive than the proteins that respond to red light. And so with that in mind, that means that, that it's not just like uniform one-to-one, -one, one photon of this plus one photon of that, because you actually can see green with a smaller number of photons than you can see red. R takes more red photons to get the same appearance of brightness. So it really gets very, very complicated very, very quickly because color is, the way we perceive color is kind of an amalgamation of all of these fields overlapping at the same time and none of them can agree on what the best way is to represent these things. Um, so you guys have to go out there and do a better job and then I can present one unified color theory to people in the future, um, but it's not there yet. Um, and just for reference, this has been going on since Sir Isaac Newton was the first one to publish a color wheel. Um, and we haven't gotten that much past Isaac Newton's work. And he was what, back in the early 1700s, I want to say late 1600s. All right. Where did it go? We don't need to see that. Really hard time finding the mouse on this one sometimes. There. Um, the other one, I really like this question about well, what about if we're trying to, if you've seen pictures that represent having UV light or being able to see in the infrared, how do they do those pictures? Basically, we use a different film or different um, tool to measure different the energy of the photons at different wavelengths and how many there are. And then we map our familiar Roy G. Biv colors onto that. So when you see something like, like heat goggles, night vision goggles, night vision goggles versus heat goggles are a little different, but infrared goggles, they're just taking in infrared data and then mapping red, green, yellow, and blue on top of it, just so that to kind of like translate it into the language that our brains speak if you wanted to use that kind of that analogy for it. But they do need to use different material to do that. And that's why also, if you see a lot of the NASA pictures, um, they take, you know, we measured radio waves at these wavelengths. And then we took all that information and they colorized it and said, this wavelength of radio wave is red and this wavelength is blue. Um, it's not actually what it looks like if you just with your naked eye looked through a telescope. Um, even the telescopes that NASA is using, they have to process those images to make those colors show up as in a way that our brains can comprehend them. Um, we're just not set up to be able to visibly see radio waves and map that to a color. <clears throat> and then last but not least, why the heck is, do we have to learn this again, but a different way? Why do things change when we get to quantum mechanics versus galactic scale? Um, and it turns out, it's because different forces dominate different range scales. So gravity, the force of gravity is most important at the scale of people and the scale of you know, planets, solar systems. But when you get to the size of an atom, electromagnetic forces are most important. They're strongest in that region. Gravity doesn't apply as much because we're talking about things with such small mass. And strong and weak nuclear force don't even apply very much because they only apply when you get to a radius that's smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So for chemistry, electromagnetic forces are what dominate and they behave differently because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, basically. You can't know where something is and its momentum at the same time, which means you're limited to how much you, how well you can establish where an electron is at any given moment. And the rest of quantum mechanics basically is derived from that. It's not that the physics are different. But it's not that the physics are different. It's just that the, the same quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle still applies to something the size of this binder clip, but its mass is so big compared to the, uns 
compared to Planck's constant that it winds up not really mattering. So instead, all that really matters is, is gravity. Electromagnetic force, if you get really, really, really strong or really, really, really close to other things. But overall, thanks for asking good questions because it means we get to start by talking about random stuff, which is always fun for me. Um, before we get into, um, back to the, the grand zone, so to speak. It's not full screen anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, we haven't even done anything with moles yet. We talked about it, mass on the periodic table. We haven't really done anything with it. I, I kind of like to save it for this point because this way we get and get back to doing conversions and doing some math because we haven't done that in a little bit, like a whole you know five days since last lab, right? Um, and doing energy of photons. Um, atomic mass on the periodic table is in units of AMU or atomic mass units. And we just have a pretty straightforward conversion for those. Um, it's on your conversion sheet. One AMU is 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So in other words, 0 0.26 zeros in a row, and then a one. That's how many kilograms a single atomic mass unit is, which is about the mass of a, of a hydrogen atom. So one, two, three, one, two, three, I'm not even sure I left myself enough room here. Three, six, nine, 12. Yeah, I definitely didn't. Six times three is 18. One, 24. That's how many kilograms one hydrogen atom is. Obviously, we don't want to write that out every time, right? So we use, one, we use scientific notation. But two, even with scientific notation, our brain doesn't really work that well when we're dealing with numbers that big or that small. We can train our brains to think logarithmically and be able to deal with um, scientific notation, at least from a mathematical point of view. But we can understand the context better if we keep it in whole numbers that are between about 1 and 100 is really where our brain works the best at being able to, to understand numbers. Um, here's an interesting, so technically, if you talk to the neurologists and neuroscientists, your brain can only count up to three things at a time. Anything more than three and your brain just says it's more than three. Um, and if you try to visually more than three objects, your brain does this intuitively. And now I'm going to tell you this so that you can never unsee it. Um, your brain will actually break things down a larger group into groups of one, two, or three, and then add them up. So if I ask you how many, uh, it's a good, uh, how many pieces of pepperoni are on a, on a pizza, your brain intuitively is going to say, oh, it's more than three. And then you, it's going to chunk it up and start saying, well, there's three there, and there's two there, and there's three there, and there's two there. And you're gonna, you're, you just start adding it up. And it's all happening at the sub, subconscious level. But now once it's one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Just try to count the number of people sitting at your desk. <laughs> two, that works there, but no, two. So I'm looking at two and two. There's four people at the desk, but I can't look and see four. I see two and two. It's just the way that your brain works, which is kind of cool. Um, but this is one of the reasons why, why we try to change units so that we're only dealing with things, numbers between about zero and 10, ideally, but zero to 100, our brain does an okay job of being able to estimate what that looks like, right? If I ask how far it is from here to Rayleigh's at the Y, you don't, you don't think in terms of feet, right? Yeah, it's a mile and a half, maybe. Like your brain knows what one and a half miles is, but if I said it's 8,000 feet, your brain intuitively says, oh, that's about a mile and a half and does the conversion for you. So when it comes to mass of atoms, we do the same thing. We just redefine a new unit called an AMU. 
as a way to, to keep it into brain friendly numbers. Maybe it's just me, but I can never count a group of things anymore without seeing my brain working and breaking it up into twos and threes. Um, so I, I enjoy that. So sometimes that doesn't always work though, keeping it to small numbers, because it turns out once we define what atomic, ma atomic mass units were pretty quickly, biochemistry shows up and says, well, that works for like tiny molecules, but for stuff on the biochemistry scale, um, that doesn't really work. So we wind up with proteins that weigh 4.7 times 10 to the five AMU. Um, so in other words, about 400,000, 470,000 atomic mass units. Um, and so we wind up redefining new units for when it comes to biochemistry. But if we just wanted to treat it as a straight up conversion problem, we can do this, right? Protein weighs 4.7 times 10 to the five AMU. How many grams is that? You're probably gonna have to write it out. Make sure you don't divide by a number when you're supposed to multiply by a number. The nice thing about units like AMU is they are, there's only one conversion for AMU, right? So no matter what you're doing, you know that your first step where AMU has to be to get to kilograms because that's the only conversion we have for AMU. So we can say one AMU is 1.0 or 1.6605 kilograms. And what's the last step? Oh, I forgot the rest of the scientific notation. You are correct. And then what will we do? Multiply. Read the question again. Don't forget your last conversion. That was to kilograms. One kilogram is a thousand grams. And then multiply. So we're gonna get something around the realm of six times 10 to the minus 18. Pretty sure about that part at least. 7.8. Don't forget your times 10 to the fifth at the beginning. Oh, it's 27, not 26. Sorry. Seven point eight, I heard. Sometimes the hardest part of the problem is writing everything down and not making a mistake when you do that, right? <clears throat> and piece of cake, right? We've been doing conversions like this for a month plus now, right? So how are we gonna make this more interesting? Why does this matter? Well. We're never, if we wanted to actually weigh out a certain amount of this protein, we're never going to be able to actually weigh out 10 to the minus 19 grams, right? We don't have instruments sensitive enough. And this is a huge molecule. This molecule is giant compared to anything on the periodic table. So we don't actually have some, a useful mass here because we can't actually measure anything out this small. So... What do we use instead? Who remembers? We use moles. We never count atoms individually or even by the dozen or even by, was it a dozen dozen? I think it's called a gross. We never measure things like that because even 10 or 12 of these giant proteins is still going to be way too small for us to weigh on a, on a scale, right? So we use moles as our way of counting things. Hey, it's a mole. It's a really fun article from a um, a physicist from 
um, from Stanford who somebody asked him what would happen if you had a mole of moles in one place. Um, turns out some funny stuff happens. You basically get something about the size of our moon made entirely up of moles. Um, I'll, I'll bring that, I'll send that link another time. But basically a mole in chemistry and in science is a way of counting individual atoms um, that we could actually measure, right? So we just say that a mole of anything is six times 10 to the 23rd of that object. So the same way we would say that that 12 eggs is one dozen eggs, six times 10 to the 23rd eggs is a mole of eggs. Right, so just a way of counting discrete objects. Where did that number come from? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Um, actually, it's not on the next slide. So basically, it's defined as the number of atoms in twelve in exactly twelve grams of carbon twelve. Um, so basically, we just had to pick an amount. Um, Avogadro was the was the scientist who who made this definition, um, and he just arbitrarily said, you know, well, we know that carbon is number atomic number six, so we're just going to say that carbon 12 being the most, most relevant isotope of carbon is a mass of about 12 grams. And he just defined it that way. And then everything comes from that definition of 12 grams of carbon is one mole of atoms. Um, it does get tricky because this kind of blurs the line between exact and measured numbers, right? Because technically we're counting discrete objects, right? But when you start counting large enough numbers of discrete objects, there's still some uncertainty associated with sudden, right? If I said, if I um, asked you to count every person that comes into the basin on 4th of July weekend, you gonna be able to actually do that? No, you could get pretty close. You're gonna miss somewhere. You're gonna skip counting somewhere or you're gonna miss a whole car of people. Right, so when you get to large enough numbers, there is still some uncertainty associated. Um, could, could you also say that a mole of protons is way back to some grams? I think that was that was uh, Avogadro's original definition, but for they had um, sensitive enough instruments to weigh that out and get a better mass for um, for mass of a proton, um, because it is, it's the same, a proton weighs one AMU out to like five decimal places, Pat. But, um, and I don't know if it was Avogadro that picked carbon. I think he was still alive at the time, but basically it was redefined down the road to be carbon 12 is 12 grams of carbon 12 is a mole of atoms. Um, but it winds up working pretty well to, to assume the mass of a proton or a neutron is close to an, one AMU within things. When we get to nuclear chemistry, we'll actually be able to show that and show how much energy is released when something turns from a neutron into a proton plus an electron. Um, and that's where Einstein's most famous equation actually shows up, E equals mc squared. We'll actually be able to use that when we get into nuclear chemistry. Um, you know, something else I was thinking about here. Uh, Oh, just for reference for how big a mole is, a mole of moles weighs about as much as the as our moon, roughly. I already said that. So it's a we know it's a big number. Here's another another good comparison. Um, if you had a mole of ping pong balls, you could cover the surface of the earth in a layer almost a mile deep. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so basically, a mole is an exceptionally large number, right? It's ten to the twenty six times ten to the twenty third. Just for for reference, you round that to the nearest power of ten, you get one times ten to the twenty fourth, which is a trillion trillion, right? So huge, huge number, way bigger than we can actually comprehend in most cases. The best thing we can do is use scientific notation or use moles because now if we put everything in moles, we can talk in terms of numbers that are more friendly to the human brain. 
All right, so is there anything tricky about figuring out how many atoms there are, if you know how many moles there are? You probably have seen this. This should all be like mind-numbingly boring. It's just another straightforward conversion, right? We have one mole of anything is six times 10 to the 23rd of that object. So if we have 1.45 moles of hydrogen, 1.45, moles of hydrogen and one mole of hydrogen, one mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or objects. Like I said, we pretty much never use this for anything besides atoms or molecules because it's such a huge number for anything that's bigger than that. Right, so we just get something like 12, 1.2 times 10 to the 24th ish. No, no, nine, sorry. I can't do mental arithmetic today. Nine times 10 to the 23rd. Frankly, the trickiest part about these conversions is making sure you know how to do scientific notation on your calculator properly. When in doubt, use extra parentheses because it's really easy to, if you forget your parentheses and you're typing this out by hand, it's really easy to get the wrong answer, which we'll see and then go if, when we're converting the other direction. All right, piece of cake, right? There's the exactly 12 grams of carbon 12. Um, we go the other way. So let's say we had, let's say we had 1.21 times 10 to the 11 atoms of, I don't know, just pick something, helium. Doesn't matter what we're talking about. How many moles is that? It's less than one mole, right? So your reasonableness check went before you hit enter on your calculator should be a pretty tiny number. So when we write this out, for every 6.022, 10 to the 23rd atoms is one mole, whatever. It should be something in the realm of 10 to the 10 to the 12, right? Ish, 10 to the minus 12. What do you get when you type it in? What is it? So this is one I want everybody to, to Type in on the calculator you're using because if you're typing things out by hand, it's really easy. So the way I would type this in, 1.21. I'm typing out the scientific notation by hand. Oh, no, 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 no. 1.21, 10 to the minus or 10 to the positive 11. <laughs> Divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Looks right, doesn't it? Oh, and that, that actually did, it took properly. Okay, so Wolfram Alpha can do this for you. I don't like that. So I'm trying to make the point that if you use Google as a calculator or if you're using your TID3 and it's not thinking for you, you get a number 
e to the positive 33, so times 10 to the positive 33 instead of times 10 to the minus 13. What happened? What did it do with my input there? Divided and multiplied. Because multiplication and addition are the same step in PEMDAS. We have them separated out in, in order of operations for convenience, but really dividing is just multiplying by the inverse, right? And so if you do this, most calculators are just going to take any multiplication and division and just do it left to right. And so if you say divided by 6.22 times 10 to the 23rd, it'll take that your number, divide by 6.022, and then take that answer and multiply by 10 to the, to the 23rd. <clears throat> so what you have to do is either get better at using the scientific notation on your calculator or make sure that you have all of your scientific notation stuff in parentheses. And now we get the right answer. All right, just by adding the parentheses. Um, the other way you can do it, instead of typing in scientific notation by hand, depending on what calculator you have, um, most of the ones all the way down to this style will have a scientific notation button. Um, on this one, it's right here. It's You have to hit the second key. It's EE, -E, capital E, capital E. is shortcut for it, times 10 to the. And if you're typing it in on a calculator or on a um, search engine or a computer-based calculator like Excel, you can hit um, 1.21 capital E. What was it? Positive 11, right? Then divide by 6.022 E23. You use that capital E. And it looks the same way on your TI-83s when you type it in. You just have to find the button for it. Then it knows to keep everything together when you're using scientific notation. You don't run into that issue. Right? So a little dry. Um, the way you can get around having to use that is just make sure you use your parentheses when you're typing in times 10 to the whatever doing conversions. Or even better, get comfortable using that abbreviation. Find it on your calculator. If you need help finding it, ask me or Mr. Toms. All right. That's about the only way that this conversion, these conversions can really get tricky, right? Is if you're failing your reasonableness check and you can't tell why because everything looks right, it's probably parentheses. The other reason that AMU is really valuable and the idea of a mole is really valuable is that the definition of an AMU actually comes from the definition of a mole. The idea of counting atoms by moles came before AMU. And so because of the definition of 12 grams of carbon-12 is has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, we can say that one AMU per atom is the same thing as saying one gram per mole. So basically, this gets us away from ever having to actually calculate anything in AMU or, or doing anything with individual atoms. We're not going to have to deal with individual atoms or AMU because we can just do everything in terms of grams per mole. So that allows us to go from moles of atoms into something we can actually measure, like grams. Right, because we have scales, we have scales, we have balances, we can measure mass as long as we're at a big enough mass that we could actually see it. So if we wanted to calculate how much does 0.5 moles of gold weigh? Is there anything we can get from moles of gold to atoms of gold? How do we use atomic mass to get from moles of gold to grams of gold. Periodic table. The periodic table has the average mass, right? So the periodic table is one giant conversion sheet if you know how to use it properly. Every single box on there has a conversion for how many 
protons per atom, how many grams per mole. So for the case of gold, we just go to our periodic table and it's, my eyes aren't what they once were, but it's, I think it's 196.97 is the mass of gold on there. That on, for every 196.97 grams of gold, is equal to one mole of gold. So we have a conversion for that. So if we have 0.5, let's make it 0 0.50 so we get to keep some more sig figs. 0.5 moles of gold, and we want to know what that is in grams. Run to our periodic table, get your atomic mass, use that as a grams to mole conversion. For every one mole of gold, that's 196.97, excuse me, grams of gold. So 98, if we're only keeping two sig figs, right? I think it's 98 point four nine or something like that, right? Why does this matter? Because we can't measure moles of gold atoms, but we can measure mass. And because the atomic theory, because of, of Dalton's atomic theory that says atoms combined in whole number ratios, chemical reactions happen in terms of moles but we can't measure moles, we can measure mass. So this is gonna probably gonna be the single most common conversion you're going to do for the rest of this class is going to be, if I have a measured value, how do I get to moles? Because moles is how the reactions happen. What about if we go the other direction? Is there anything tricky about going from grams to moles? rather than moles to grams. Yeah, we're just gonna flip this so that grams is on the bottom. So let's do, let's do the 52.017 grams of silicon. Of course, I put examples where I don't actually have their atomic masses memorized. Um, which is probably for the best. I have to go look it up, up now. We have grams of silicon. Find the atomic mass on the periodic table. Silicon's right under carbon, right? Uh, with that black on green, I can't read that in the slides. Is it 28? 28.085 grams of silicon is one mole of silicon. So you just, just like any of our other conversions, set it up so that grams cancels grams. And we're left in moles. Something just under two, right? What do we get? And how many sig figs do we get to keep? We started with five. These are measured numbers. So we do have to take into account the periodic tables, atomic masses. Some of them don't have five sig figs on them. Some of them only have um, four, or in some cases, even three sig figs um, on some of those atomic masses. So you, depending on what periodic table you're using, that'll change how many sig figs you get to keep occasionally. But other than knowing that those are all measured numbers, there's nothing really that tricky about this, right? All right, so let's talk about where those, those periodic table atomic masses come from, why they're measured numbers. Um, the atomic masses on the periodic table, 
are examples of weighted average. So remember when we first learned to do Google Sheets or spreadsheets, and we said that, um, and we did that great fake grades where we had to make up a, a weighted average for your final grade for your students, right? We said, you know, it was 30%, 30% of it was the homework and 40% of it was an exam and the other 30% was quizzes or something like that. Right, the, um, that's the exact same way that these work. So for the, for the grades, it was final grades equals whatever your weight was like, okay, 0 0.4, 40% um, of it was quizzes or something, right? Plus 0 0.4, Three, 30% of it was exam. And 0 0.3, another 30% was homework. Looks, if not familiar, you guys remember doing this at least, right? Weighted averages on the periodic table work the exact same way, except instead of a grade for each category, you have a mass for every isotope that occurs on Earth. And instead of having nice neat, nice, neat percentages, like 40%, 30%, 30%, you have measured numbers called percent abundances or natural abundance. And this is another case of our periodic table is earth centric. These numbers change depending on where you are in the solar system and what solar system you're in. Different solar systems are gonna have different natural abundances of all these different elements based on the um, you know, the star that went supernova to create that solar system in the first place, right? So this is, these are just applicable to earth, but that's, you know, none of us are really doing any chemistry outside of earth right now. Keyword right now, right? There's actually an entire field. Um, it's not, I don't think they use the prefix Xeno because that applies to living things, not from earth, um, but extraterrestrial geology there's a guy whose entire job is geology of Mars, where he interprets um, what's going on on Mars for all the various Mars rovers and the data that they get back. He might have to use a different, a different periodic table because Mars has different natural abundances than Earth. Um, so there are people doing this with other periodic tables, but for now, this works. All right, and so this is, remember that, that sigma, you talked about sigma notation before, right? Sigma just means to add everything up. So this looks like a big scary equation, but it's just basically the condensed way of writing this. This is not a fancy X. This is a Greek letter. Anybody know what that Greek letter is? Chi. C-H-I. So the Greek letter chi in chemistry specifically lowercase Greek letter chi, means um, it's a lot like percentage, but as a decimal. So we call it mole fraction. So if you have a particular element or a particular isotope that occurs 98.2% of the time, chi will be 0.982, right? And then you multiply it by the mass of that isotope and then you just add up all the pieces. Right for however many naturally occurring isotopes you have. That's where your atomic masses come from on the periodic table. It's just, this is a measured number, this is a measured number, and they just add them up to get that weighted average. This always leads to the, the question, some, I'm actually a little surprised we ha I haven't heard it yet. How come in the periodic table, some of the mass numbers have brackets or parentheses around them? What does that mean? Those, those are known as the synthetic elements, meaning man-made. I mean, that they're also made in naturally occurring processes, but most of the synthetic elements have a short enough half-life that they disappeared long before humanity even existed, let alone knew to look for them. Like technetium, number 43 is the smallest synthetic element. I want to say that it's got a half-life that's measured in like maybe in thousands of years, um, which just means that all of it was gone 
when the solar system formed, all of it was gone before he, you know, before Earth existed, let alone hum humans. Right. So in that case, what's usually listed is the most stable isotope. So because the most stable isotope for all these radioactive synthetic elements, the most stable isotope is going to be the one that you're most likely to actually see or or um, do any calculations with. All right. Let's do a practice. Chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes on Earth, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The natural abundance of chlorine isotopes is 76% chlorine 35 and 24% chlorine 37. If you know what the mass of chlorine 35 is and the mass of chlorine 37 is, what's the weighted average atomic mass of chlorine that will show up on the periodic table? We might need more sig figs in order. Let's add an extra zero to the end of some uh, 0.76 and 0.204. So if we only have the two isotopes, our atomic mass calculation just looks like 0 0.760 times the mass of Chlorine 35, so 34.99698889. And 0 0.240 times 36.9659. And you can write grams per mole or you can write AMU for these since they're the same. When I have a, when I'm here doing it on the board in front of you, this is really straightforward, right? It only gets tricky if I don't stand up here and do it for you, right? Yeah, exactly, thank you. That's the way I always think about it, but somehow when you get a blank piece of paper in front of you, everybody's mind goes blank. I get that. Like the elements quiz. What do we get for a number? Point seven six times thirty four point nine six eight nine plus point two four zero times thirty six point nine six five nine add it up. 35.5, right? 0.4. So depending on where you rounded and how you added things up, your sig figs might be a little bit different, but it's going to be really close to 35 and a half. So if you round it to the right spot, then you're still fine, right? 35.5 and 35.4 are the same number as far as I'm concerned within sig figs. If you're off by one in the ones place, that's a different story, right? That tells me probably that you typed something into your calculator wrong because I can't see any other way you could be off by a whole one. All right, here, is a real world example. I gotta make it smaller so we can read the whole thing. Not used to having the monitor crop part of my there we go. So depending on where you get lithium from the Earth's crust, you can get different um, different atomic masses. So the pieces still weigh the same. The mass of all the different lithium isotopes are gonna be the same no, no matter where you get it, but the relative abundance changes depending on where you get it. Some places, lithium seven is more common 
than it is in other places. For instance, lithium-6 and lithium-7, more most of the time you get 7.5 of the 7.5 percent of the lithium atoms are going to be lithium-6 and the rest is lithium-7. But if you get it from material that's from nuclear waste, lithium's a by lithium-7 is or sorry lithium yeah lithium six is a byproduct um from some nuclear reactions and so you wind up with some cases where lithium it's enriched from lithium six with respect to lithium six um if you ever heard of in enriched uranium or enriched nuclear fuels all that usually means is that they ramped up one of the specific isotopes, natural abundances in that sample to cause some reaction to become more common. Sometimes by adding neutrons and sometimes it's actually, if you, if you mine uranium, you get a mixture of uranium 235 and uranium 238. Um, if you want to separate those two, because uranium, I always mix up, which is which uranium 238 is the one that you can, is weapons grade uranium. Um, sometimes they can, they literally just have giant centrifuges because there's, they have different densities. And so you wind up with the lithium 238 sinking to the bottom of your sample. Um, so they don't actually even add the neutrons themselves. That's what causes the fission reaction though, is when you have extra neutrons around. Um, but enrichment is literally just a giant centrifuge. Um, and it changes these percentages by, you know, a few percent points sometimes, sometimes a little bit more, and that's all it takes to make it weapons grade versus power plant grade. Oh. So what's the atomic mass for the natural source? Does that match the periodic table? Exactly, it should. You would think they wrote this equation using the or this uh, problem probably using that periodic table. Yeah, so for the first one, your atomic mass is equal to with 0.925 times math of mass of lithium seven, which is 7.016 plus the rest, 0 0.0725 times 6.015. Do I need to write the rest of the sig figs on these? Why not? We're going to round to only three sig figs anyway, right? So as long as I have the masses to four, if I have the masses to four sig figs, then that's not going to limit my rounding. This is already limiting my rounding. So four sig figs is good enough. What changes for the other source? Not the masses, right? Just the abundances. So if it's 0 0.0375 and the rest is lithium seven, what are we gonna plug in here? Point, point what? Point 0.9625. Because what do we know about these two abundances? The key is this line right here. And the rest is lithium seven. We know that the, just like we know percentages have to add up to a hundred. We know that the percent abundances have to add up to one. Right, so if it's 3.75% 3, 3 lithium six, 100 minus 3.75% of it is lithium seven. 
What do we get for this one? Six point what? Not too tricky, right? Once you've seen this once. The only way I can make this trickier is if I do things like don't give you all the percent abundances directly. And it gets that part gets trickier if you start having more than two pieces, right? If I say something like it's 78% of it is magnesium 24, but then, um, and the rest is magnesium 25 and 26, and they occur at this ratio relative to each other then you have to get creative with your algebra equations a little bit. But this part doesn't change no matter how many pieces you have. All right, questions about atomic mass. And this time I am going to remember that we end at 35. And but that does give me enough time to finish my thought on, from Friday. We ended kind of on this slide and the bell rang five minutes earlier than I was anticipating. So I didn't get to make my final point with these, with these um, charges when it comes to the octet rule. So the octet rule is the one that says that almost everything is more stable if you have eight valence electrons or sometimes 18 valence electrons or in the case of hydrogen and helium, two valence electrons. Basically, if you only have full or empty orbitals is when ions get most stable. Yes, so your ionization energy changed. It means it's easier for it to get from point A to point B. So, but it's two different things we're really talking about. We're in this case, we're talking about what's what are the most stable ions we could make. And that is when it corresponds to having a full octet or having only completely filled or empty orbitals. But the, how easy it is to get there depends on the ionization energy. So for instance, lithium has has a fairly low ionization energy, it wants to lose one electron to be stable. But it's not gonna, its ionization energy is high enough that it's not, you can have metal, lithium as a metal and it's relatively stable. As you go down in the same column, they all wanna try to get to be plus one. They all have one electron to give, but it gets easier and easier for it to get to that point, to the um, point where if you take potassium is a metal um, and just expose it to air, to oxygen, you can have it spontaneously ignite. It'll, it oxidizes, it rusts so quickly and gives off so much energy when it does so, that it'll catch fire just from being out on the counter. Lithium doesn't do that. So that's the difference with the ionization energy changing, but they're both trying to get to plus one. All right. Last, I don't have the other one. So basically, if we want to predict the most stable charges, we look at how many valence electrons it has, because it can either gain electrons. If it's a non-metal, it's going to try and gain electrons, become more stable. And if it's a metal, it's going to try and lose electrons to become more stable. And knowing how many electrons it has to gain or lose depends on that um, electron configuration. So for columns one and two, columns one and two, we don't have any E orbital involved. So columns one and two are easier. Column one wants to lose one electron to be stable. So they all turn to plus one. Column two has two electrons to lose, so it turns to plus two. The transition metals get weird because they have all of those different possible energy states. When you have all those different possible energy states, a lot of times there's more than one possible state that's stable. And when I say trend B block, I mean everything basically starting from column three all the way until you get to the stair step line. 
a lot of the most of those have more than one possible oxidation state, more than one possible charge. So the only ones I'm going to ask you to memorize. There's aluminum, gallium, and zinc, which have predictable charges. Zinc and cadmium have predictable charges. What do you think the charge on the zinc ion is going to be? Plus two. Why? Did you remember? <laughs> that's a good answer, but you have the tools to be able to describe it better. How many valence electrons does zinc have? Two. Two. And is anything weird happening with its d orbital? It's full. It's Once full, you get a full, full d orbital, you're never going to not have a full d orbital. Right? So zinc and cadmium are only ever going to be plus two because they full d orbitals, the only electrons they have to lose are their s blocks. Aluminum, gallium, indium are all going to be plus three because they also have full d block or no d block. But then they have that one extra electron in the p orbital they can lose as well. Then the last one, silver. Silver kind of hits a sweet spot. Remember how we talked about copper is irregular because it, it can fill its d orbital at the expense of having a full s orbital, right? Um, but that, and I know I just said that once you have a full d orbital, you never break it up. Copper and gold behave oddly. Silver, on the other hand, behaves exactly how we would expect. Silver's electron configuration is krypton plus 5s1 for d10. So silver is always a plus one. Zinc and cadmium are always plus two. Aluminum, gallium, indium are always plus three in their ions. Everything else has multiple possible charges, and I'm not going to make any numbers. Okay. So mercury has mercury is really weird because it, it can be a plus it can be a plus two like you would expect. It can also exist in this weird weird dimer where you get two mercury plus ones attached together. Um, and so it basically, when because you start getting more positive interactions, stuff gets weird. The copper can be plus one, but it can also be plus two. Right, so I'm not going to have you memorize the book much, and then I'm not going to this the ones. It'll be a minus point, but that, but yeah, and even if you forget and you do it Monday morning, that's minus half of one time before we have class. Okay. No worries. I, I know that that happens. Derek, you play for you don't play for the Lakers, do you? You're still under eighteen, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, I play for Tahoe Hockey Academy.